Matthew chapter 28, and we'll be there in a second, but I received some bad news uh, last Friday. My brother-in-law, my wife's brother, uh, passed away at the age of 52. That's pretty young. She had a, a, another brother-in-law passed away years ago who was 32. It just seems like they're getting younger and younger nowadays compared to what I can remember when it was usually our aunts and uncles and grandparents that were passing away. And so it, it just really caused me to, to think about uh, what, was, what was going on in all of that. People started asking me uh, questions, you know, do you believe he's in heaven? You think you'll see him there and so forth. Uh, you always hear people uh, who have uh, lost someone that they really love, and, and they always... Uh, they always encourage everyone that we'll see them later in heaven. You know, they're in a better place. And it doesn't matter who it is, whether they're religious or whether they're Christian or, or, or what background they have. It seems like everybody thinks that we're going to see them in heaven somewhere, a better place, whatever that better place is. Unfortunately, that's not true. When we read the Bible, the Bible is very clear. There are two places that people go after death. One place is heaven, and the other place is Hades, or what we call hell. It's eternal separation from God. The Bible says a great gulf, a fiery pit that is eternal. And so there are these two places. And not everyone gets to go to heaven. Not everyone gets to go to hell. It's a choice that we all have to make. And just thinking about the whole scenario, I just... Really, the Lord laid it on my heart deeply that I need to share with the body of Christ what it means to be born again, what it means to really be a Christian. Because so many call themselves Christians, but are they really Christians? Do they really know the Lord? Do I really know the Lord? How do I know that I know the Lord for sure? Have I changed? Has Christianity changed me from the inside out? Have I been born again? Because there is a process by which God works. And I'm going to talk a little bit about that process. Let me give you an idea of that. And how that born again uh, definition, how it changes people. There was a man named George Whitfield. We know him as a great circuit preacher. Uh, we know Greg Laurie. He, he's a great evangelist. He goes out and, and has crusades throughout the world. And, and, and hundreds if not thousands of people come to know Jesus Christ. Um, we know that uh, it's not him. We know it's a move of the Holy Spirit. We also know, though, it's a move of the people's decisions uh, for Christ or not for Christ. I, I remember we were in San Diego for another conference, and we met this guy uh, as we were uh, going out of the, the hotel, and he was in the elevator with us. And we told him we were going to a uh, crusade. He says, oh, yeah, I went to one of those crusades, and I asked Christ into my heart, and uh, it didn't work for me didn't work for me and he had a beer in his hand he was going to a party you know and, and it's the choice that the people have do I accept Christ and do I accept his word and do I accept what he has commanded us to do it changes us one way or another George Whitfield was like Greg Laurie but he rode on a horse and he went from town to town preaching the gospel to everyone but there was a time where he wasn't saved at the age of 16 he became uh, deeply convicted of his sin, 16 years old. He realized that he was a sinner and he fell short of God's glory. He realized there were some faults in his own heart. He wasn't just looking at others, he was looking at himself. He tried everything possible to erase that, that sense of guilt, that feeling that he had uh, failed, you know, that, that religious sense that, that, that was put there by others and so forth. He, he did everything. There was one time where he fasted for 36 hours, just fasted and prayed and, and seeked the Lord. Twice a week he did this in hoping that somehow God would, would forgive him, but yet he felt nothing. He felt more miserable. The harder he worked for this cleansing, the harder that he tried, the worse that he felt. And then by God's grace, he met Charles Wesley, who was another circuit preacher during the time uh, we have the wesleyan churches that came out of uh, his him and his brother and he met he, he met this guy and he who, who had put a book together and or put a book in his hand and showed him from scriptures that you must be born again or be eternally lost 
And he made it very clear to him. And so finally, by the work of the Holy Spirit in his heart, Whitfield came to understand uh, Jesus' words in John 3, which we'll get to in a minute. And he believed and was gloriously saved. And after that became the great preacher. So understanding the scriptures, understanding what it means to be born again, it changed his life that he became a circuit preacher. And we're going to talk about that. Now, first, there's a great commission, and we see that in Matthew chapter 28. Look at verse 16. Jesus is speaking to disciples. They already crucified him. They buried him, and now he's resurrected. And and he's giving a commission to the disciples, 12 men that he had raised up uh, to be, in a sense, evangelists who had become apostles and teachers in the beginning of a new church, a new way, not the old Jewish uh, commandments and so forth and, and religious system of the Sanhedrin with the Pharisees and the Sadducees, uh, just a whole religious system. He said, no, this is something new, new wineskin, something better uh, that's by grace and not by law. And, and so he took these men aside and he said, this is what I want you to do. As he spoke to the 11 disciples minus Judas Iscariot who had betrayed him, He said, he went away to Galilee to the mountain which Jesus had appointed for them. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and spoke to them saying, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of what? The Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit teaching them to observe all things that I command you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the ends of the ages. Amen. This is a commission by Jesus to his disciples. This commission is also for us as pastors and leaders of churches, but it is also for you. You are a part of the body of Christ if you have accepted Christ Jesus into your heart and you have become a disciple of Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ, if he was standing here, would tell you the same thing. Look, I have all power and authority in heaven and on earth. That's a lot of power when you think about it. That's power that's available to all of us through the Holy Spirit. And so there's no excuse. Well, I can't do it. I don't speak. I can't share. No, there's no excuse. God Almighty dwells within you. And, and, And if we take the steps of faith, God can use you in a mightily way. It is amazing what God can do with a man that's willing and yielding himself to the Lord. And so he said, go out and make disciples. And I want you to baptize them. And I want you to baptize them in the name of the Father and then of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And I want you to teach them. Teach them what? The things that I have commanded you. And so this is our responsibility as a pastor of a church to teach the body of Christ, the things that God has commanded us to do. And there are commands that Christ has given to us to do as believers. And as believers, we willingly accept those commands and say, Lord, these are your words, these are your truths, and and this is how you want all of us to live in this world. And so teach us these things that we may reflect your character, O Lord. Teach us that we may glorify you. Now, if... If every one of us would take these words to heart and pray about inviting just one person, one person to church or or one person to the Lord, we would double in size here within a week's time. That's how simple it is mathematically. Or two people, we'd triple. But it's a matter of us making a choice to say, Lord, we're your disciples and we need to go out and find disciples and not just sit on a Sunday morning and then leave and enjoy the rest of the world. I did that for 20-something years with Catholicism. My parents took us to church every Sunday. And of course, right after church on Sunday, we'd have our barbecue and the beer, and everyone get drunk and have a good time. And come Monday, go to work and start all over again. And then come Saturday, go to confession and confess everything you did wrong, and then start on Sunday morning again and start all over again. I did that. Uh, that was religion, and I was miserable in that type of system. No, now I've come to Christ, and I enjoy serving him. I love serving him. We were here yesterday from about 8.30 until 3.30 in the afternoon, and it was fun. 
just seeing everybody here, enjoying, fellowshipping, remembering, sharing. I mean, it was just an exciting time. I really enjoyed it. And I could do that every single day. What's the difference? What's the difference? Well, it's, the difference is religion and relationship. Because in a relationship, you can endure the, the time, you can endure the seat, and you can sit and enjoy because you have a relationship with someone, a relationship with God. And if that relation and that connection is there, then time is nothing. Uh, service is nothing. It's done with joy. It's done with, um, with anticipation that you're pleasing him and knowing that. And the same goes with all of us as believers, right? If we're connected with one another and we create relationships and then we start to fellowship and then we're there for one another. That's what fellowship is all about. Now we have to notice here though that someone needs to be saved before they can be a disciple, before they can be baptized, before they can even obey the word. They have to be saved. They have to come to know Jesus Christ as their personal Lord and Savior. And let me speak about this salvation for a moment here. There are three tenses in salvation that we find in the Bible. Well, what do I mean by a tense? Well, that's the, the, the grammar and language. It, it, it's a time. It, it's past, it's present, and it's future. So if, if I was talking to you on the phone and I said, hey, it was great seeing you, then that was past, right? I saw you in the past. If I'm talking to you and I say, hey, great seeing you, then that's the present. I'm seeing you right now. Or, or if I say, hey, I can't wait to see you, then that's future, right? So those are the tenses. So the same is true of salvation. I can say that I have been saved, and I was saved back in uh, 1987, the uh, Lord came into my life. I was saved. But I also can say that I'm being saved. Wait a minute. I thought you were saved. Yeah, but I'm also being saved. We'll talk about that in a second. But then I can also say I shall be saved in the future. So three tenses, and all these tenses are true. Uh, let me sh break that down for you. I have been saved. In John chapter 5, verse 24, he said that he, he that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me has eternal life. Now, I have right here and now eternal life. If I believe in his word, and the word belief means trust. It means dependence. It means that you lay your whole life upon the fact that Jesus is who he said he was. And, and you're betting everything on it. And so if you trust him and you believe in him, then the Bible says that you have eternal life. The moment we trust Christ, the moment we receive uh, that gift of God of eternal life, uh, it's as much as, as saved as a billion years from now or even of today. It is complete. It is done. It is over. You're saved. Also, I'm being saved. There needs to be a work in you. I was saved, but I'm being saved. Now, there's a work in that. We'll, we'll call it for now sanctification. I'll explain that in a second. It's a work that works in us through the Holy Spirit. Paul could say to the Philippian Christians in Philippians 2.12, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God which works in you both to will and to do of his good pleasures. So God is working in us. Now here we are, sitting here today, and God is working in us. This is the process, the present. This is the present right now. At this moment, God is teaching us something about the gift of salvation, about what it means to be born again. And we either receive it and learn and grow from it, or we don't. But it is God, through the Holy Spirit, working in us to serve him. And so in this church, at this very moment, there are people all around, and not just in, inside here, but outside. There, there are people in the kitchen cooking because they're being saved at this moment. They are working out their salvation. They're cooking, they're preparing so that when we leave, we can go out there and enjoy some food and then some fellowship. There's people out there watching the parking lots. They're actually watching your cars, make sure nobody comes in or breaks in or do any damage to the vehicles and so forth. And they're working out their salvation, and it's the work of the Holy Spirit. Um, this is how it works. Now, it's not that they are working for salvation. It is something that accompanies salvation. It's kind of like a, a fruit tree. 
if you plant an orange tree, you can go to Home Depot, and usually right around now, you get the bare roots. Uh, there's no fruit sign. There's no leaves. It's just a, it's just a stick, it looks like, with the clump on the bottom of it wrapped around with plastic. You take that, and, and you put it in the ground, and it says it's an orange tree. And you put it in the ground, and then you water it, and you plant it. Now, by spring or fall the next year, you expect to see some green and then some flowers and then apples? No, not apples. Lemons? No, not lemons. What do you expect to see? Oranges. Oranges, because it said it's an orange tree. And you expect to see oranges on that tree. Now, if you see some other type of fruit, then you go, boy, did I make a mistake? <laughs> I thought it was an orange tree, but it is an apple tree. So something went wrong there. It was labeled wrong. It wasn't my fault. They labeled it wrong. Or I wasn't looking at the label close enough, and I thought it was an orange tree. But there's definitely something wrong because I bought an orange tree. That was my intention. So with salvation, when we accept Christ Jesus into our hearts, we are now saying we are Christians. And if we are Christians, then there has to be fruit working out our salvation. And that fruit has to be what? Not worldly fruit. Not what the world is enjoying, not what the cultures dictates, not what society dictates, not what the government dictates. You know, it is what God dictates. It's the works of Christ. And so he's working those things out in me. Philippians 2, 2. Now, that's a process though, isn't it? And it's a slow process. It's a process where God has to do the work, not me. I can't force you to do it. I can only explain to you how it works, how it worked in my life, worked in George Whitfield's life or anyone else's life. But it's up to you then to seek out this truth and ask God, would you help me to work out my salvation so that I can please you? Now that takes time, right? That orange tree, you plant it in the, the winter. Do you expect oranges the next day? No. There's a process that you have to wait for. And so we have to be patiently waiting for one another, right? There, there's growth. There's time. You, you're introduced to Christ. You accepted him in your heart. Now what do I do? Start, start reading your word. Start understanding who he is. Start letting the Holy Spirit cleanse you and remove these things slowly. And once you start doing that, you start realizing, wow, my life's changing. I'm not doing the things I used to do. You know, the things that, the, the views that I had before, I'm not having those same views. I have a different view now of things, of life. And I have this tendency and desire to do something, to help people, to get involved in church, to be a part of the kingdom of God. And those, that's a slow process. Personally, for me, it was a fast process. Within six months, I was already involved uh, of accepting the Lord. The Lord just took a hold of my life in, in a very powerful way through the Holy Spirit. And I wanted to do everything I could to please him. Everything. And that's just me. That was me. He had a, he had a specific plan for my life. You know, might not have agreed with it at the time, but he did, and I had to submit myself to it. But I've seen others where it's a slow process. And generally speaking, it usually is a slow process for a lot of people, especially in today's uh, society and age, because um, religion and Christianity is so confusing today. There's so many different types of Christian churches out there that people are confused to the truth. And I just wish that people would just go right back to the word and read it, and then they wouldn't be so confused. Because you have the Joel Olsteins, you know, with mega churches. You, you, you have the Rick Warrens, you know, with huge churches and campuses like Disneyland. You know, you have these churches teaching topicals and message about how you can do this and you can do that. And then, and then you have other churches that are, gifts and weird and and so people are like confused and so it's a slow process now because they're trying to figure out which way is the right way and it's tough when you're just trying to figure it out in your own head but if you go to the scriptures and you start reading god will reveal that truth to you and that's what i did i just started reading now let me say it a different way the future salvation I will be saved. That's in the future. That's when you go to heaven. The day you die, you're in the presence of God Almighty. You're completely saved at that moment. It's done. It's over. There's no turning back. It's complete. And the total peace, rest, no more, no more tears, no more suffering. Boo, that's the day we're looking forward to, right? Amen? I mean, I am. <laughs> you might not be, but I am. 
Now let me say it a different way here. Uh, it's a theological uh, terms that I'm going to be using here. It's also called justification. You might have heard of those words before. Justification, sanctification, and then or sanctification can also be regeneration. Those two words are, are working together. Or glorification. Justification, sanctification, glorification. You, have you heard those words before? Uh, justification. Now, I, I, I looked up some dictionaries and commentaries and it's pretty amazing how everyone has a different view on justification itself you have a calvinistic view you know that the justification is totally god's work it has nothing to do with us we don't even have a choice in it then you have the arminian view you have the catholicism view where justification and sanctification are together you know where, where, where it's christ on the cross but it's your sacraments that save you that justify you, and they somehow are combined together. Then you have the Protestant, which I lean towards more, of justification. And justification basically was interpreted as God's declaring man to be righteous. God declaring man to be righteous. Thus recovering the sense of the original Hebrew term to be distinguished from sanctification, in which man made righteous. So it, there's a difference between justification and sanctification. God declares a man righteous. How does he declare a man righteous? By Jesus Christ, his son, his blood that was shed on the cross. He's declared righteous because of his blood. And so God looks at us through the lens of Christ and we are declared righteous. You may have heard it said this way. We are justified just as we've never sinned. Well, wait a minute though. We've sinned though. So how can he look at us as though we've never sinned? Because he looks at us through Jesus Christ's sacrifice on the cross. And that's how God views us. And so we are justified by God through his son, Jesus Christ. And then sanctification is another process where we are being made righteous. 2 Corinthians 3.18 says sanctification is described as a changing from glory to glory. So now it ties in with the glorification because as we're being sanctified, God is working in us, working out of us the old nature and putting in a new nature in us, the new man. We're, we're going from glory to glory to glory to one day, boom, we're glorified and we're in heaven with God. And that's when perfection of sanctification takes place in the glorification of God. So we're justified by God. God sees us if if this was us if this was us in all our wretchedness and evilness you know and, and and god says look i can't accept you because the way you look you're kind of cone head there you know i don't like the way you look so i can't accept you you need to be a little more flat-headed you know and so he sends his son he dies on the cross and his son covers us so now god sees his son the way he sees us so now we're righteous before him so we're justified just as though we never sinned because christ was perfect he fulfilled the whole law and so we're justified. We're saved. It's done. For by Ephesians 2 8, for by grace you have been saved. Boom, it's done. It's a great, it's grace. It's a gift of God. It's God's favor upon us. But then the next statement is through faith. Through faith, Paul says. That's the sanctification. Now we come to the next step sanctification uh, or the present of salvation. And God is working out in us. So let me give you some practical examples, you know. Drinking. I used to like drinking. And one day, and I think I shared this with the guys, one day um, I was at a block party and I had a drink in my hand trying to witness to my neighbor. And the Lord just kind of said, what are you doing? I says, what are you talking about? I'm witnessing. I'm sharing my faith with this guy. He goes, yeah, but look at what you got in your hand. You know, and it was a, it was, I think, uh, Dos Equis, you know, because I like that, or Heineken, one of those, those. And so I'm like, oh, wow, <laughs> here I'm witnessing and I'm drinking at the same time. And so the Lord was sanctifying me. He revealed it to me. And so I said, Lord, take this away from me. And he took it away from me. It, it took about a year or so, but he finally took it away from me. Cussing, you know, a person who cusses. There are people who just cuss all the time. Like every other word is a cuss word. And that takes time to get rid of. And all of a sudden, one day, God will just take it away. And you realize, I'm not cussing anymore. Remember, there's a story of a Marine 
and I guess Marines are known to cuss, I guess, you know, and so he was cutting his lawn, cussing away, was he cutting his lawn, you know, this and that, and cussing and swearing, and he accepted the Lord, and the Lord was working in his life. One day he said he was cutting his lawn, and as he was cutting his lawn, he realized, boy, I haven't swore once. That is so strange that I didn't swear once. I didn't even realize I didn't swear. You know, that's the work of the Holy Spirit doing it in his life. So God begins to sanctify us. Now, how does he do that, though? Sometimes he puts us through trials. He puts us in places where people confront us, right, on issues. There might be a flaw in your life, a characteristic that you have that's an old nature, that's of the world, and someone confronts you and, and says, hey, did, do you know you do this all the time? Who are you to judge me? See, now that's a person that's not willing to hear or re listen to a rebuke from the Lord. A person will be willing to say, let me take what he said, and is it true? And then, Lord, I need help. I need help to work that out in my life, that sanctification, that process. Are you willing to say, Lord, help me in this process because you are going to glorify me one day? Now, on the other hand, that person that's rebuking you, he needs to be patient and I say, how come you haven't changed yet? You know, I revealed it to you, you know, so come on, hurry up. You know, what's, your, what's, what's the problem here? No, that's not your place. You revealed it, now let God take care of it through the Holy Spirit. And, and some of us are still working on it after 20 years. You know, it's a process and we have to be patient. God has not called us to, to be our brother's, um, what's the word that I'm looking for? taskmaster in a sense but to encouraging and lovingly care and pray for them that god would uh, do his work in them as philippians 2 said it's it's the lord god working through them this process glorification implies uh again as the last event and in, in the change from glory to glory it's the perfection of sanctification in the process now this is all called just for those of you that want to know this is this is all called soteriology soteriology and it's a doctrine of salvation through christ jesus and his work alone so what does it mean to be born again look back at, at john or forward to john chapter 3 I know this works because it worked in my life. And I know it works because I've seen it work in other people's lives. And so I know that there's truth here. But I also know that people are not willing to allow God to work in their lives. And that's where I'm trying to head with this teaching is where are you? And I don't mean to offend you, but where are you? Are you born again? This man, Nicodemus, <clears throat> saw what Jesus was doing. He heard that he was out there he was sharing a different message and people were being saved and, and people were being healed. And obviously this guy is someone important. God is doing something here. Obviously there's something big going on and I want to know what it's all about. And a lot of us get to that point in our life where we're tired of our old life. We're tired of the way we lived, the things we're going through. It's like th there's got to be something different. Something different, something better. There just has to be. And that was Nick. That was where he was at. It says in verse 1, there was a man of the Pharisees na named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from, from God. So he understood all that. He knew there was something about this guy, this rabbi. Rabbi, we know that you're a good teacher come from God, for no one can do the things or these signs that you do unless God is with him. And Jesus answered and said to him, Most assuredly I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. So Jesus stopped him in his tracks, didn't even let him ask, ask the questions. He just said, Look, Nicodemus, you already understand the law. You're, you're a Pharisee, you're a religious person. You know, you understand it all. I want you to understand this. You have to be born again in order to enter the kingdom of God, in order to have eternal life, in order to be saved. You have to be born again. That's pretty clear. You get any clearer than that. You can go to an eight-year-old kid and, and read the scripture to him, and they're going to say, well, you have to be born again in order to get to heaven. It's very clear. So the question is, what does it mean to be born again? And am I born again? Now, later on, later on, 
we see in John that he's going to give us a description of what it means to be born again. But we see Jesus here basically telling Nicodemus exactly what he needed to hear. The Greek word genau means to be born. And anen, it's A-N-O-T-H-E-N, and then meaning again, also can be rendered from above or anew. So the birth that Jesus spoke of was therefore a new birth or a heavenly birth that takes place in us or both is what he's saying there. Now Nicodemus misunderstood him, but he knew he was talking about a birth because he said, wait a minute, how can we go back into our mother's womb? So he understood that he was talking about a birth. And so Jesus said, born from above, you know, the spirit of God, you know, comes and goes where it wishes, you know, that which is flesh is flesh, that's what is spirit is spirit. And so Jesus was being very clear to him that you have to be born anew or from above. Well, how does that happen? How does that happen? Well, he goes on in, in chapter three, or chapter three there and goes to verse 16 and says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish and have everlasting life. Again, the word believe in him. You believe in him. You believe if you're out in the ocean and you're in the water and you've got a, a inflatable boat and it's leaking air and you're ready to, to, to sink and, and, and someone comes along and says, hey, why don't you jump in uh, this solid boat and I'll save you. And you're like, I don't know. I kind of like my raft. It's a little bit better than yours. You, know? you have a choice. Do I stay here or do I jump in that boat? Well, you jump in the boat and then you get saved. So you have to believe in Jesus Christ. You, just, you don't just say, oh, I believe in him. No, it's not what it's saying. You have to believe in him. You have to then live with him and for him, for his glory in order to be saved. You must be born again. And so... Being born again is being born from above. <clears throat> it's a new life. It's a new way of thinking. Peter the apostle understood this completely. Now, these guys walk with Jesus and they probably heard this and the definition of it quite often. Peter said this, Having been born again, 1 Peter 1, 23, not of corruptible seed, but incorruptible through the word of God, which lives and abides forever. So Peter understood that, that we must be born again. And this process of being born again was, was not just a, a process that took place in a person's life by saying a few words, but it was done through the word of God. The word of God was revealed to them, then they accepted it, and then it began that process of sanctification in their life. Paul also believed in this process. Ephesians 4.24, Paul said this, that you put on the new man, which was created according to God, in true righteousness and holiness. Well, how did he create it? It was through his son, Jesus Christ, who died on the cross. He was righteous. But we are to put on the new man. Again, there's our part in the sanctification. We are to put on the man. We are to seek out to serve the Lord. Paul also made it very clear in 2 Corinthians 5.17. I love these scriptures. I love these scriptures. You know, when I started, um, <clears throat> when I got saved and I, I started changing, it was even before I read the word. I just... The Holy Spirit was just in me so powerfully that, that, that I just started changing from the inside out. It was just a, a natural process of God's Spirit doing it. And it was so weird because it was kind of like, why am I not doing that anymore? And why is it that I want to go to church? No one's told me to go to church. I never read anything that said that I need to go to church. But for some reason, I have this desire to go to church and have someone teach me the Bible. I don't know why that is. I have this desire to serve God. Why do I have that desire? I don't know why. And I would come across scriptures like this in 2 Corinthians 5, 17. And he said, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. The old things have passed away. Behold, all things become new. And I'm like, wow. That's exactly what's going on in my life right now. 
It's like God is removing these old things and everything's becoming new in my life. Like, wow, this word is alive. It's powerful. It is amazing. It just woke me up. And so I know that this is possible. Some other places that this word is used, born again. Uh, John 3, 7, as we just left John, you must be born again. Um, 1 Peter 1, 3, by his mercies we have been born anew to a living hope. Uh, 1 John 5, 1, he who believes Jesus is the Christ is born of God. James 1, 18, he brought us forth by the word of truth. Brought us forth meaning the new birth. John 1.13, born not of blood, but of God. And so not the fleshly birth, but the spiritual birth that he's talking about there. What is born of the spirit is spirit, John 3.16. So is everyone who is born of the spirit, John 3.8. Whatever is born of God overcomes the world. That's part of sanctification. There's an overcoming power that we have over the world now you might be in drugs you might be into pornography you might be into something else well God has given you power to overcome this because you are his child and you are a new creature in Christ Jesus and he's given us that power in the birth of Christ so whoever is born of God overcomes the world first John 5 4 no one born of God goes on sinning If you have sin in your life, you will not practice it. You will fight against it. It will convict you. You will know that you're not supposed to be doing this. And so you're crying out to God to deliver you from it. Because you can't go on sinning because you're a child of God. The Holy Spirit has a hold of your heart. And he knows that it's just damaging you if you continue to do so. That's part of the new birth. No one born of God goes on sinning. Uh, you can find that in John 3, 9, 1 John five eighteen. He cannot go on sinning because he is born of God, 1 John 3, 9. He who loves, loves is born of God and knows God. If you love, it's strange, we were talking about that yesterday, love. You know, love is not what we think. You know. uh, can I say this but not offend the ladies, please? Please don't take this in the wrong way. But our society today, uh, they're really trying to make men uh, into women. Uh, we're not. Women view love differently than men do, and it's a fact. And so all the, the feeling, the emotions, you know, that l- romantic stuff, that's not what men feel all the time. Men are men. You know, we like to fight. We like to argue. We're going to prove our point, that type of thing. And, and we... The ladies try to change us. That's not love. Love is not an emotion and a feeling, unfortunately. Paul is very clear in Corinthians what love is. You know, love is patient. Love is kind. Love is not rude. You know, love does not keep record of wrong. Love trusts. Love's hope. You know, that's what love is. And, and so when we love, love corrects. Love chastises. That's all part of love. And so that love, God gives to us through the Holy Spirit in that new creation that he can give to us. As I shared uh, again, one of the first things that God uh, taught me was I needed to love Virginia's family again because I did not love them very much. And God came into my life, forgave me, and I needed to forgive them. You know, and so I had to, through the power of the Holy Spirit, do that. And that's a love that God gives to us. You are my sons. This day I have begotten you. Psalms 2.7, Hebrews 1.5, Hebrews 5.5. 5. Again, we're his sons. God has begotten us. He has born us spiritually he who is born of god keeps him from the evil one who will not touch him first john 5 18 and so all over scriptures we find out there's a new birth there's a new life we are new creatures we need to understand that you know it was the apostle matthew that god saw at a tax office and he just went up to him and said matthew come follow me you know what matthew did he stood up and he followed him and that's so strange. Was, uh, you know, I would have probably said, well, wait a minute. Let me ask you a few questions here. And Jesus says, no, you come follow me or not. And again, it wasn't just let me follow you, listen to you, but not do anything. No, Matthew did a lot. He did a lot. There's a story. A police chief, Donald uh, Wolford, 
of Spencer, Iowa, believes that when anyone has a complete reversal of character from one week to the next, there is something deeply wrong with that person. The man he was, or the man he had in mind was his officer, Kenneth, 25 years old, a former foul mouthed boozer who got con- converted while vacationing in California. Officer Kenneth came back to work with a Bible and plenty of Jesus talk for speechless fellow officers. Can you imagine that? Going for one week to California, get saved, and you come back and you're like a totally different person. I mean, it, it makes sense to be your, your superior to say, wait a minute, you're not, something's wrong here. You're not the same person. So this is what happened. Uh, no profanity, no booze. Uh, or for, uh, his commander suspended him for allegedly disobeying uh, of orders and failure to properly perform duties. But the Civil Service Commission reinstated him, scolding the city for improperly obtaining reports of his mental condition. The commission then ordered a new brief suspension, saying the policeman should have obeyed an order not to read his Bible while on duty. That was the order he was, he was supposed to follow. Don't read your Bible while you're on duty. And of course, he kept reading his Bible. And of course, officer agreed and said that I was a little too zealous on my job. And so I agreed that I shouldn't read my Bible. But that's what happens when you are encountering Jesus Christ and you make this connection. Uh, you would go home and someone say, you're not the same person. You're not the same person. My boys will attest to you that if some of them might not even remember, but when I partied, I partied. Uh, there were times where I'd have my wife take everything out of the fridge and we would have nothing but beer in there from top to bottom. And, it, and they would all go by the end of the night. That's the way I was. And then Christ came into my life and there was the connection. And I tell my wife, I'm a born again believer. She's like, what? What is that? I'm a new creature in Christ Jesus. I'm not doing these things anymore. And she was like, yeah, right. And she saw it right before her eyes. My life completely changed and many others. And so will you because you are born again, because you have asked Christ Jesus into your life. Now, Virginia's brother's death was unexpected. But I think that uh, God is using it for his glory. There are many who have said, and I don't know because I didn't really have a relationship with him uh, very much. I've known him since he was you know, in junior high. Uh, I know all his faults. I can tell you that. I know his personality, his character, because uh, I've seen it. But people in, who have spent time with him in these latter parts have said that he's changed because he had accepted Jesus Christ when he went to Texas to work, stay with my sister, went to a Calvary, and apparently he asked Christ into his heart. Now, it wasn't overnight that he changed, but in the few years he changed to a certain degree. So I don't know. That's between him and God. But let me tell you this. If he is born again, he is in the presence of his Savior, Jesus Christ, because that's what the Bible says. It's an important subject, a very important subject that we need to understand, all of us, whether you are or you're not. So I ask you not to offend you, but are you born again? Have you asked Christ into your heart? Have you asked Christ into your heart, and are you into Christ? Have you become that new creature in Christ Jesus? Do you see that things are not the way they used to be? You don't view things like you viewed him before. Your life is not the same. It needs to be different. You need to have a pure life, a holy life, a life that you separate unto God. You need to show forth fruit that you are a believer, just like that orange tree.